preface of war and woman by mrs st clair stobart this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recorded by celine major war and woman by mrs st clair stobart prefatory note by viscount escher g c b i have been asked to write a few introductory words to this book as president of the county of london territorial association i became acquainted with mrs st clair stobart and her work we have differed much in opinion but we have worked well together for the interests of the territorial force like her i have resigned my connection with the british red cross society not being satisfied that the organization plan and sphere of operations of the society although philanthropic are framed with a sole view to the welfare of our country when mrs st clair stobart told me that she was going to the balkans with the convoy corps i reminded her of my publicly stated objections to sending assistance to foreign armies engaged in war on the ground that any help whatever however humane the motive is a breach of neutrality and is tantamount to taking part in the war this record of the convoy corps achievements in the balkans proves how effectively a body of well-meaning philanthropic and earnest folk can assist combatants patching up wounded to go and kill and maim their opponents thus breaking the law of neutrality as completely as though they supplied arms or cash or munitions of war or even volunteers in a cause which is not the cause of our land and people mrs st clair stobart has however done this great service she has proved by experience and example what women can achieve in war and although i am not prepared to accept all her inferences and assent to all her deductions on the disputed position of women in the social ordinance of civilized states it is impossible to resist her plea for a reconsideration of the place assigned to them in the scheme of national defence nursing the sick and wounded in war is clearly woman's work the detailed arrangements their plan and ordering are a sphere of activity for women in peace as matters now stand nursing schemes are worked out and stereotyped by the military authorities without advice or suggestion from those who in war will have to bear the chief burden the plea has always been that the hierarchy of the r a m c know all about war and its requirements whereas women know nothing this book disposes of that fallacy it is doubtful whether any r a m c officer can claim an experience equal to that of the convoy corps and its medical staff has full advantage been taken of this experience so dearly purchased by weeks of physical and moral suffering i should be curious to know in russia and in japan the red cross society is admirably organized and its work is far-reaching in peace and war in great britain there is no one body or one authority that corresponds to the red cross society in those countries here there are as usual cross currents in peace and sure confusion in war the respective spheres of the british red cross society the order of st john and the r a m c are quite undefined and urgently require definition if mrs st clair stobart's book succeeds in drawing public attention to the want of sound organization for the relief of the sick and wounded in the schemes of imperial offence and defence it will have achieved the object with which i hope it was planned and written escher Proem when it was first suggested to me on my return from the balkans that i should write a book describing my experiences during the war i was taken by surprise oh no certainly not i answered why it would be all about myself it had besides never occurred to me that anything had been accomplished worthy of being written about i had done what i set out to do and there was an end of it i thought i had wished to give a practical demonstration of the fact that women are capable of taking an independent and serviceable share in national defence that demonstration was successful and thereafter it was nunc dimittis as far as i was concerned but then it was borne in upon me that unless this demonstration was a demonstration to the public its significance as an object lesson would be lost it was my duty i was told to place on record the experiences of this little company of women who had after opposition from the home authorities performed on their own amidst some difficulties in a foreign country work which has not before been done exclusively by women within the area of war i then realized that the object which i have at heart the inclusion of women as practical and living factors in the territorial service 
might be adversely affected by my silence it is useless to toy with ideas ideas if they are worth anything must be hammered in it was horrible for me that there was nobody else to do this particular bit of hammering but as it had to be done i yielded i am not a writer of books and i dislike publicity to be thus compelled to write in book form and in the first person singular was a double nightmare i confess i would almost rather have gone through my war experiences again than have written about them but now it is done and i am only anxious that those who may read the story shall understand that it has not been written under the belief that we accomplished during our balkan expedition anything wonderful there was nothing wonderful about it the book has been written solely with a view to showing that women can be of independent service in national defence the experiences i have gained in the balkans have taught me many things as a result i am convinced that if women are to become efficient members of a national service and are to be allowed to give to the nation's defences of their very best they must no longer be played with as at present by the british red cross society scheme of voluntary aid detachments they must be trained and adopted wholeheartedly by the territorial army women must no longer be regarded as apocryphal numbers but as worthy to be included in the inspired text of the national religion of patriotism as a protest in this direction i have resigned my membership of the county committee and also of the executive council of the county of london branch of the british red cross society because i feel that the telescopes of this society are as concerns the work of women directed to the past rather than to the future and there is no hope that under the aegis of this organization anything practical will result from the moment when the b r c s inaugurated under the war office its system of v a d s i have in conducting the women's convoy corps worked loyally with the former society in the hope that through them my ultimate aim of obtaining for women an adequate training will be fulfilled i am now however convinced that the b r c s is not the appropriate medium for providing the country with an imperially and practically trained body of women that being my belief i have felt it necessary to resign not only from the b r c society's committees but also from the women's convoy corps of which i was the founder and the organizing commandant for the corps has always been from the time of the inception of the v a d scheme intimately associated with the red cross society and rather than ask the corps to sacrifice this official respectability and come out into the wilderness with me i have resigned and become a freelance it is not without sorrow that i relinquish the fellowship of an organization which had become an intimate portion of my life and dissociate myself from red cross work but paper protests are valueless and though the b r c s is a large and influential body and is not likely to be affected by my secession i believe that no genuine protestant ever protests quite in vain upon the two subjects with which the book deals war and women i have probably spoken more firmly than will be commendable to many but for anybody who has passed the jellyfish stage of existence it would have been impossible to encounter war in the balkans and women there and elsewhere as i encountered them without deriving from these experiences strong impressions one way or another i condemn war and therefore militarists will be offended and i vindicate women and anti-feminists will perhaps be shocked but condemnation and vindication are both alike based not upon book-derived theories but upon practical observation i can therefore offer no apology for presenting untainted evidence but both militarists and anti-feminists will probably in chorus accuse me of inconsistency how they will demand is it possible logically to condemn war as a barbarism and yet in one and the same breath to plead that women should participate in war but the inconsistency is on the part of the governments of europe these spend millions annually in providing materials for the mutual destruction of each other's armies and then expend further millions in providing hospitals surgeons and red cross paraphernalia for the restoration to life of those same armies if these governments have made up their minds that it is virtuous to kill their enemies in accordance with the mohammedan rather than the christian faith it would be more consistent if they abolished red cross work but no man in europe has the courage of this conviction in the meantime so long as the honour of the men of a nation is involved in taking life so long must the honour of women be concerned in the attempt to save life 
from this there is no logical escape and for this reason women and war beauty and the beast must make their grim alliance m a stobart end of preface and proem chapters one two and three of war and woman by mrs st clair stobart this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one for the first time in history a company composed exclusively of women has had the experience of going to the front in a campaign and of improvising and administering in a foreign country a hospital for sick and wounded soldiers the women's convoy corps was invited by queen eleonora by the bulgarian red cross society and by the bulgarian medical military authorities to render assistance during the war of the balkan states against the turks the contingent which went out in response was self-contained as to doctors nurses cooks etc and numbered including myself as organizer and administrator sixteen i propose in the following pages to describe the experiences with which we met during our ten weeks in bulgaria and also to discuss the general subject of women in warfare and to attempt to answer the question ought women to take a practical share in national defence and to be included as an integral portion of the territorial service now this innocent-looking word ought is the most misleading word in the dictionary for it assumes a plain and pious issue between something that is comfortably right and something else that is definitely wrong whereas public opinion the sole arbiter of standards of right and wrong never recognizes that a thing is right till it has been shown to be expedient and this makes all the difference for it means that if you really want to convince the public that a thing is right and that it ought to be done you must prove to the public that the thing will be expedient for the public that it will not that is injure more public interests than it will serve but expediency cannot be proved by either of the two arch humbugs which are usually trotted out to cajole the unwary expediency cannot be proved by either argument or figures argument can prove that black is white black grown shabby gets grey white grown dirty gets grey and things that are equal to the same thing are equal to one another q e d and figures can prove on properly manipulated balance sheets that income and expenditure have hit it off to the very farthing a proposition which is for most of us an obvious absurdity but argument makes the mob mistrustful and figures are for the multitude figures of speech only the arts and wiles of argument and of figures combined are powerless to persuade that conservative old entity public opinion that some new course of action will be for his interest until this has been proved by practical demonstration florence nightingale might for instance have argued with the eloquence of demosthenes that it was right for a woman to nurse the sick and wounded and that she ought to be allowed to face the horrors of the crimean war for that purpose she would never have got there she however showed the genius of the true reformer she demonstrated by practical methods her capacity for alleviating suffering and by conduct not words proved the expediency for all concerned of allowing women to do work for which nature has specifically fitted them between vague wavering capability and fixed indubitable performance as carlyle puts it what a difference and now the women's convoy corps have given a practical demonstration of the capacity of women to be of independent service in warfare it is hoped therefore that this account of their work may help to prove the expediency of allowing women not only to work in hospitals of war but to take a responsible position in the territorial service of the country End of chapter one chapter two the origin of the convoy corps was as follows i had been living for some years on the african veldt in the transvaal where one was face to face with real things big things things of life and death no one had time out there to write about things or to talk about things one had to do things but when i came back to london i found everybody very busy writing and very busy talking about two great dangers which were at that moment supposed to be threatening england the first was invasion of this country by germany this was expected every morning at breakfast time with the arrival of the daily mail and judging by the press generally and by the conversations at clubs street corners and dinner tables the population was in a real state of panic 
but i was surprised to find that the golf courses bridge tables and other familiar centres for the unemployable were no less crowded than usual with men who talked tearfully of the rotten state of the territorial army but were themselves doing nothing for its salvation and with men and women who deplored the unpreparedness of england for the landing of the germans but seemed unanimously to think it was somebody else's job to be prepared the other danger with which i found england confronted was the possibility of the granting of the parliamentary franchise to women i had not at that time studied the question but i was struck with the quaint way in which women were ignoring the one proof of expediency which was to hand women refused to see that the best way of proving to public opinion their power of judgment in political matters concerned with the larger and imperial parliament was to give a practical demonstration of their political judgment as elected members of the lesser parliaments the county and municipal councils but women i found took an interest in municipal elections precisely in inverse ratio to their interest in votes for women in burlesque fashion this only available practical demonstration of women's political capacity was being exploited by the anti-suffragists who argued that though women were unfitted to select others even though these others were men to do work in the larger parliament for which there is little individual responsibility they are fitted to be themselves selected to perform in the lesser parliaments work for which there is in the absence of an autocratic cabinet much individual responsibility a gilbertian climax was presently reached believing that municipal work is women's work believing further that conviction is worthless till it is converted into conduct i accepted an invitation in march nineteen thirteen to stand for westminster in the forlorn cause of progressivism for election to the london county council i then found that the suffrage societies were all too busy getting the parliamentary vote to be able to assist in securing the return of one of the few women who were standing as l c c candidates whilst the anti-suffrage societies which are concerned with showing that municipal work is the one and only legitimate outlet for women's political activities would not assist my candidature because forsooth i was though not a militant suffragist a believer in the political enfranchisement of women but these two dangers invasion by germany and invasion by women the scylla and charybdis upon which it was feared the british empire might at any moment founder had neither of them at the time of my return to london from the transvaal been investigated by me imbued however as i was with the practical philosophy of the veldt i was at once struck by the juxtaposition in time and space of these two problems the coincidence seemed as far as women were concerned full of interest and significance for if it were on the one hand true that the country was momentarily liable to invasion by a powerful enemy and that our defence was as represented totally inadequate then it seemed obvious that the help of women might usefully be employed in national defence whilst as concerning the right of women to the parliamentary franchise how i argued could women prove that they were capable of taking a share in the work of national and imperial parliaments unless and until they had shown their capacity for taking an interest in national and imperial affairs so long as women's interests were purely personal and parochial so long must their influence remain personal and parochial and how better could they show their interest in national and imperial affairs than by taking a share in national defence for if women desired to share in the government of the country it seemed plain to me that they must share in the responsibility of defending the country and here is the bedrock cause of the foundation of the women's convoy corps the only way of showing that they are capable of taking a real share in national defence is to prove it by practical demonstration this task of demonstration seemed well worth while since two birds of public danger would be hit by one stone i felt convinced that there must be some form of service in which i myself for instance could be of use in national emergency and what i could do could also so i argued to myself be done by thousands of other women i therefore set to work neither to write nor to talk but to do my first task was to discover whether there was anywhere within the territorial organization a gap wherein the services of women could usefully be employed i found my gap in that sphere of operations which occurs between the field and the base hospitals for according to the usual routine 
the wounded receive first aid treatment and are removed from the battlefield to the field hospital by the royal army medical corps and so far all is well but the r a m c are a mobile force and have to move on to other battles with the troops from the moment therefore that the wounded have been first aided and deposited in the field hospital they are left to the tender mercies of voluntary orderlies or stray benefactors to take charge of them during their convoy to the evacuation hospitals along the lines of communication or to the base hospitals which may be at a distance of many days journey by road or rail precisely during the precious first hours or it may be days when most care is needed least is procurable and experience recently gained during the war in the balkans more than confirms this earlier belief that in every branch of work that occurs within this zone of operations the activities of women could usefully be employed with a view therefore to training women to be of general service in all forms of work occurring between the field hospital and the base the women's convoy corps was inaugurated i was fortunate enough to secure the cooperation of major langford lloyd d s o who was at that time head of the r a m c school of instruction in london with the help derived from his practical knowledge of the requirements a three years course of training was instituted and the following subjects were included in the curriculum first aid nursing cooking plain convalescent and camp laundry housewifery signalling morse and semaphore driving horse and motor riding cycling map reading and mapping life-saving in water stretcher and ambulance work wagon drill fire drill improvisation work in field and in hospitals etc an annual camp in camp the women live in tents which they pitch and strike themselves they dig their own camp fire trenches construct their own camp kitchen and cook their own food in the open whatever the weather may be they perform all their own quartermastering and steward's work sleep on straw mattresses in unboarded tents and without the aid of male hewers of wood and drawers of water undergo a general training in improvisation discipline and self-reliance and learn generally speaking to approximate as nearly as possible to conditions likely to obtain in time of war of these subjects some as will be seen have a direct educational value for the object in view whilst others have for their main object training in resourcefulness self-sacrifice endurance discipline the evolution in short of a body of imperially trained women ready to turn their hands to any work which the nation may in emergency require of them but it will be suggested is not hospital nursing given a much too insignificant place in this scheme of work surely nursing should be the first and foremost if not the sole object of training it is within the hospitals that women's work must lie this is the view apparently held by the b r c authorities and the war office who have since the inauguration of the convoy corps organized a scheme of v a d s composed respectively of women and of men to look after the home defences of the sick and wounded but i contend and my experience in the balkan war confirms me in my belief that it is not within the organized and fully equipped base hospitals that the help of volunteers men or women is in time of war required there exists already in this country a magnificent staff of fully trained nurses who are competent to deal in hospitals with ward work from which amateurs and volunteers are better excluded it takes a trained nurse three years of continuous training and drudgery within the walls of a hospital to learn the work and discipline of the wards and it is absurd to imagine that a few lectures on first aid and home nursing even supplemented by an occasional odd day or two or even a few weeks in the outpatients department or the wards of a friendly hospital is going to qualify a woman who is not making nursing her work in life to understand all the intricacies and to deal with the diseases and conditions incidental to ward work the distinction between professional and amateur is probably in no profession more marked or of more importance than in that of nursing and it seemed to me for every reason desirable that the sphere of the professional nurse should be clearly differentiated from that of the volunteer nurse the latter should be regarded not so much as a nurse as a first aider to give first aid in every department of work occurring between the field hospital and the base the distinction between trained nurse and volunteer first aider should be complete both as to work and uniform it was to my mind grotesque that women after attending half a dozen lectures on first aid and home nursing 
should be allowed as under the regime of the b r c s and the war office to wear a nurse's uniform and regard themselves as fully competent members of a v a d qualified to take their places in a scheme of national defence it is not within the wards of base hospitals but in improvisation and in the rough and ready emergency work required in getting the wounded to the base hospitals that the help of those who cannot give their whole life to the work of nursing is required it was with a view to training women for this object that subjects extraneous to nursing such as ambulance wagon driving riding cooking washing map reading etc were included in the curriculum of the women's convoy corps End of chapter two chapter three this training had been satisfactorily in progress during four years and afforded every reason for belief that women trained and disciplined could take a responsible share in warfare without the need of gibeonites of the male sex who ought all if able-bodied to be in the fighting line but no opportunity of putting the training to a practical test had up to the autumn of nineteen twelve occurred and i was obliged to content myself with the knowledge that an imperially minded body of women was being trained for any national emergency which might arise and that this training was also of present value in that it taught women to be of a greater service in their own homes in domestic emergency in time of peace as well as of potential value in national emergency in time of war but in october of nineteen twelve the balkan war cloud burst bulgaria servia greece and montenegro declared war against their traditional enemy the turk the newspapers reported that thousands of wounded were daily being poured into hospitals which were overcrowded and understaffed and it was obvious that the arrangements for nursing the sick and wounded were generally inadequate the expediency of admitting women as nurses in the wards of hospitals of war had already been proved here it seemed was an opportunity of proving the expediency of extending the sphere of operations of women's work in war i realized that at all costs advantage must be taken of an occasion unique for the purpose of testing character by the opportunities it would probably afford of difficulties and hardships to be encountered and overcome i heard that the b r c s was dispatching units to nurse the sick and wounded and i at once applied for myself and for specially selected members of the convoy corps to be included amongst the first volunteers to be sent to the front every member of the convoy corps is also a member of a v a d registered with the b r c s at the war office the work and value of the training of the corps was well known and appreciated by the b r c s as well as by the w o and as only those members were offered for service who possessed special qualifications either as trained nurses or for length of service in the corps i had every hope that my offer would be accepted my feelings therefore can be imagined when the fiat went forth that the b r c s intended to send units consisting of men only to nurse the sick and wounded men of whom some as was eventually revealed knew more about the rules of football than of hospital work there was it was said no work fitted for women in the balkans now i ought doubtless meekly to have acquiesced in this decision of the supreme authorities i was meek for half a day and then i realized that many fully trained women nurses outside the corps even better qualified than some of us were also offering their services and were being refused because they were women and i felt that the whole cause of women's work in war and national defence was in danger of being retrograded by this decision of the b r c s for women were now being kept back even from that sphere of work which florence nightingale had as we imagined conquered for women once and for ever i determined therefore to go out to the balkans and see for myself whether there was indeed no work fitted for women or whether as i suspected the truth was that the b r c s imagined there were no women fitted for the work i knew better i knew that there were plenty of women admirably fitted for the nursing of sick and wounded whatever the conditions might be i believed that any work for which women were fitted was work fitted for women and i made up my mind to judge for myself upon the spot as to whether the conditions in the balkans were prohibitive or whether there was not indeed work in which trained and disciplined women could well in such a crisis be of use if after investigation of all the circumstances i should find that the work was unsuitable for women an unlikely contingency where nursing was concerned no harm would have been done but i should myself presumably gain some experiences of conditions in hospitals of war 
if on the other hand i should find as i fully expected that the services of trained and disciplined women were urgently needed i could cable to the members of the corps who had already been selected to join me wherever our work should be required the selection of candidates for this service necessarily caused some heart-burnings for in addition to technical qualifications length of service in the corps knowledge of french and german age no one under twenty-eight was eligible and stability both physical and physiological had to be taken into account doctors women from outside the corps had also to be selected for though no definite idea could be formed as to what work would be likely to be required i formed a notion in my own mind as to the work i wished to do i selected women rather than men doctors for the purpose of fully demonstrating my argument that women are capable of undertaking all work in connection with the sick and wounded in warfare had i waived this principle as regards the medical staff i ran the risk of being told if the experiment should succeed or equally if it should fail ah yes but then you see you had male doctors with you but provisory arrangements were quickly made and i found myself after a preparation of two days entrained on the orient express en route via paris vienna and budapest for belgrade the capital of serbia End of chapter three Chapters four, five, and six of War and Woman by Mrs. St. Clair Stobart. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter four. Belgrade was reached after forty-eight hours of uneventful travel. It was here that I gained my first experience of war conditions, and as I walked through ward after ward of the first hospital I visited, I understood the value of a first impression the soldiers objected to open windows the rooms were small there was no ventilation and the evil odours of gangrenous wounds and repulsive smelling disinfectants the sight of room after room crammed to every available inch of space with men who had been made after a design that was godlike but were now mutilated out of recognition of any design that first impression of the results of war had for me the significance of a revelation i had left england believing with most people that though war is in some ways undoubtedly an evil it may on the other hand as contended evoke qualities of heroism which would otherwise lie dormant and that it might thus possibly have a place in the universal scheme but as i looked at those blood-smeared bodies those mangled human remnants suffering tortures that had been inflicted by man upon man and was conscious that in hundreds of hospitals throughout the balkans the same ghastly tragedy was at that moment being presented i knew that sanction for such carnage could only come from sophists whose vision of life is limited to the material the manhood that has been in war must says emerson placidly be transferred to the cause of peace before war can lose its charm and peace be venerable to men but if the cause of peace is able in this twentieth century to offer no greater opportunities for the exercise of manhood and heroic qualities than were expended in producing suffering like this then i felt life itself has no significance and the motto that should be inscribed for each newborn child over the portals of its entrance to this world should be not enter ye into the life everlasting but abandon hope all ye that enter here thenceforth i regarded the suffering in the balkan hospitals as a litany in which i too must join a litany to the god of peace a supplication for the enlightenment of europe in this big military hospital which i first visited there were six hundred wounded soldiers seven doctors and fifty untrained volunteer and local women nurses all the larger houses and every available gymnasium school institution or hall in belgrade had of course also been converted into improvised hospitals conditions varied in accordance with the available resources and the prevailing personality of the director of the hospital but everywhere the wards were of necessity overcrowded the staff of doctors pitiably undermanned and the nursing almost entirely carried out by volunteer local ladies and peasant women utterly untrained for their grim gigantic task the smell of some of those unventilated wards overheated with iron stoves is not easily forgotten one room in which the odour and the heat were particularly offensive measured as i roughly estimated eighteen feet by fourteen feet and contained at the moment of my visit twenty-four people including twelve patients doctors nurses and visitors and there was not an inch of open window anywhere 
one soldier in this room was specially on show he had been wounded in the left arm and the bullet was said to have made its exit after the manner of a conjurer's egg from his right side he boasted proudly that he had killed twenty turks with one bayonet presumably not all with one thrust he presented me with an exploded hand grenade which had been thrown by kurds and had killed one of his friends another soldier in the same room had been hit in the shoulder by a shell in fourteen places the more the merrier apparently for he was particularly cheerful and showed me with pride a silver snuff-box which he had looted from a dead turkish officer he was in great pain but he was he said trying to get well as quickly as possible so that he might go back and have another go at the turks and yet in many of the rooms though turkish officers were placed in a room apart turkish soldiers and albanians arnauts were lying in the same wards mixed indiscriminately amongst their serbian enemies the dead too frequently lay side by side with the living undivided even by a screen i noticed a specially fine-looking young servian peasant who without disfiguring bandages or splints was lying quiet and motionless with closed eyes he had been shot through the lungs he is passing over said a nurse as i stood and looked at him in a few minutes he'll be dead by the bedside sat an old white-haired man dressed in the sheepskin coat baggy breeches and white navushtas of the servian peasantry his eyes were riveted on the face of his only son suddenly the boy sat up struggled for breath gave a last look at his father and fell back dead the old man grasped the unresponsive hand pietro he cried then looked in consternation at the nurse a serbian lady volunteer she said nothing but fetched a candle and lighting it placed it at the head of the bed the father understood and whilst the last offices were performed sat in silence his face hidden in his hands then at a word from the nurse he rose looked for the last time at the beloved face a sheet was flung over the dead boy and in silence the old man without looking back walked with bent head down the ward and went out childless there was too much to be done for the living there was no time for sentiment towards the dead or dying in the next bed another soldier about to join his dead comrade was tossing restlessly and plucking at the blanket the nurse impatient to get on to other work was trying to make the dying man take paper and pencil in his hand he petulantly refused he won't believe she said that he is dying we want his name he has no number but i am not dying he gurgled i shall but the sentence was never finished he fell back he had passed from the reek of battlefields and the fetid smell of hospitals to a happier rest-house where no number was required do you write to the relatives i asked oh no replied the nurse a serbian lady of society there is no time for things like that and she hurried away to help put back into his bed a man who though suffering from compound fracture of both legs was with others returning from the surgery where he had been taken to have his wounds dressed for owing to the scarcity of doctors and the fact that there were few if any trained nurses it was customary in some of the improvised hospitals for all the dressings to be done in the surgery and the patients had to run the risks and endure the pain of being carried when absolute immobility was essential by peasant men unused to the work up and down the stairs and through the long winding corridors every time the dressings were changed but great as was the need for trained nurses at belgrade there was no lack of local volunteers and i felt that belgrade was not near enough to the active zone of operations for my purpose i therefore after visiting as many of the improvised hospitals as the hours of one day would allow and after also paying a visit to the wife of the british minister who was herself working day and night in one of the hospitals went on to sofia the bulgarian capital End of chapter four chapter five the train took twenty-four hours the railway service being of course disorganized and given up to conveying soldiers guns and military stores to the front and carrying the wounded to hospitals along the lines of communication there was no sleeping accommodation or dining car and any restaurants there might be at wayside stations were always besieged by starving soldiers and were quite inaccessible but a lesson in frugality was given by a fellow traveller a fine old servian priest of the greek church to ched by name 
he was more than contented with occasional slender portions of brown bread and cheese which he had brought with him and never seemed to know the need of drinking he was in great spirits having just left his wife and thirteen children and his parish near niche to go to the front not in his ecclesiastical capacity but to fight he had enlisted in what was called a free regiment a regiment that is of volunteers he wore his usual garments an overcoat over a long black cassock black breeches coloured home-knit stockings long boots and a black astrakhan cap with a small gilt cross in the centre of the front i asked him in the german language in which we were conversing how he reconciled his christian principles of loving his brethren with his eagerness to fight and kill his fellow-men he promptly dived into his deep pockets and produced a testament printed in the old slavish text and read aloud in triumphant tone he who loves his brother will die for his brother my brethren have for centuries he said been killed and tortured by the turks i will help to deliver them i fight he added with two weapons the rifle in mock show he extended his arm and took aim and with the crucifix and as he spoke he kissed a crucifix worn on a long chain round his neck then put it back reverently under his cassock but i asked with sympathetic experience of the inconvenience of skirts when active work is on hand how do you manage to fight in that long cassock isn't it horribly in the way oh no that's quite simply managed he replied see here and in a second he had tucked it all up on both sides through the pocket slits leaving his legs quite comfortably free but my fine old friend wasn't only a warrior and a priest he was also a poet and was carrying in his handbag a whole packet of unbound booklets of poems composed by himself he had written them specially he said to stimulate his fellow-soldiers at the front and judging by some of those which he translated into german for my benefit he was better as a poet than as a priest for the verses though they all breathed the fire and slaughter spirit of medieval times were full of poetry and inspiration they afforded to me a naive illustration of the fact that my apparently refined and cultured friend was in reality representative of a plane of thought which elsewhere in europe would only have been appropriate in the middle ages indeed in these poems the prototype used throughout as the main incentive to heroism was that old fourteenth-century servian hero stephen dushan self-styled tsar of macedonia monarch of the serbs greeks and bulgarians and people of the western coast the throttler as he was surnamed by others and not inaptly for he was a prodigal builder of churches sure sign in those days that he had committed many crimes for which atonement was required the subject of one poem which i specially remember concerned an old man who was pictured as speaking at the graveside of his only son supposed to have been killed in this same war against the turks the father was not grieving over his son's death but was on the contrary congratulating him on his good luck in being now in the presence of the great national hero dushan and was urging the boy not to hide his lights but to be sure to let dushan know at the first opportunity how brave he had been in battle and to tell him exactly how many of the enemy he had killed before he himself was struck there was a strange pathos in the reflection that all that was noblest in this fine old poet was still breathing the atmosphere of six centuries ago the intervening years of turkish tyranny formed a spiritual hiatus which had to be ignored by poets and heroes it was an arresting thought too that this old man a type of the finest characteristics of the spirit of the past had sacrificed everything work wife and children in order that his nation should now at last break through the darkness of those intervening centuries into the light such as it is of the western world one couldn't help also surmising that if dushan had not come to a sudden and untimely end the slavs might have federated and driven the turks out of europe all that long time six hundred years ago my old friend firmly believed that servia bulgaria and montenegro were now at any rate joined in a lasting federation and in answer to a doubt which i expressed as to whether when the turks had been defeated there might not be disputes among the allies as to boundaries etc old tched schlidjevich replied enthusiastically no no why we are one people we have one faith one language and now soon we shall be free to work out our own destiny and though they are now in deplorable fashion working out this destiny along the lines of example set them by western europe 
the allies are in their internecine fights and struggles only going through the inevitable process of testing their relative strengths before settling down to the work of nationhood if only turkey is excluded from re-entrance to the arena the evolutionary process in the balkans will probably soon be in full swing passions of territorial ambition and of jealousy have it is true caused the allies in their mutual distrust to forget the first object of their crusade but this is only temporary the spirit of this old poet warrior priest was as i discovered later truly the spirit of the balkan peoples they had at that time all alike tucked up their cassocks and turning their backs on everything in life that was less dear than liberty had gone with crucifix and rifle and memories of dushan to the front End of chapter five chapter six as the train drew up at sophia the station was a nightmare of bewilderment every inch of platform was crowded with brown uniformed bulgarian and servian soldiers on their way to the front wounded soldiers returning from the front and with women who swarmed round every incoming train in the hope of finding relatives and friends the genus porter alone was missing from this congeries of humanity and it was a bit of a puzzle to know how to get one's luggage conveyed from the van where it was mixed up with military and red cross stores ammunition and wounded soldiers to the hotel bulgaria but after a chaotic scramble this was accomplished and i hastened to get to work upon my mission having been given an introduction to dr radeff director of the bulgarian red cross society and a son-in-law of m geshoff i telephoned for an appointment and received immediately a courteous invitation from dr radeff to call at once at his house and have a talk he accepted gratefully on his own account my offer of the services of the convoy corps but said he must communicate by telephone with dr kiranoff the p m o head of the medical and military department who was then at stara zagora at that time the headquarters of the bulgarian army in the meantime dr and madame radeff who both talked excellent french most kindly offered to show me as many hospitals as i could digest and took me that same sunday afternoon to see first the red cross hospital established in the école militaire where one thousand wounded soldiers were being housed the nursing of the wounded was throughout bulgaria being supervised by queen eleonora a princess of the house of rus a trained nurse who had been a sister in the russo japanese war and who not only understood the work but was devoting herself heroically night and day to the organization of the hospitals she was at that moment away from sophia at philippopolis and it was on my return to sophia a few days later that i had the privilege of meeting her the nursing at the red cross hospital was in the hands of volunteer ladies of society who for the most part wore linen frocks and white caps and aprons with red cross badges on their arms though nearly all were untrained and had at first been quite unused to sights of blood and horrors they one and all gave it as an invariable experience that though they had previously imagined they would faint at the sight of blood they had not even felt squeamish when it came to the reality there was no time they said for anything but to work at relieving the overwhelming mass of human suffering which was all around nearly all of them had near relatives at the front and i asked one lady whose husband and two sons were fighting if she had heard lately from them and where they now were she told me that she had not heard for ten days and that even when they wrote they were not allowed to give the date or the name of the place from which they wrote nor were they allowed to mention names of those who had been killed or wounded no list of killed or wounded would be published till the war was over how dreadful for you i said sympathetically as i realized the agony of such prolonged suspense oh my friend replied but it is much better not to know if one knew that the worst had happened one would grieve and that would hinder work and there is so much to be done oh much better not to know this same brave spirit characteristic of bulgarian womanhood was also illustrated in the case of another woman a widow who had lost two sons in the war the news that they were dead leaked out and some one told her of the loss tears came into her eyes but she quickly brushed them away saying sternly don't think i am crying because my two elder sons are dead i am crying because my two younger boys are not old enough to go and help drive out the turks and it was this spirit of determination to get rid of the turk at all costs because the turk hampered their evolvement into nationhood that turned every bulgarian man into a soldier every woman into a nurse 
and was the ideal which inspired one and all to their marvellous victories and though to the politically short-sighted the subsequent war of bulgaria against her former allies appears to be a relapse in barbarism and bloodthirsty and territorial greed even this war with its disastrous consequences is an inevitable outcome of that first so-called righteous war in all evolutionary processes there occur periods of mutation when a rearrangement of the corpuscles of which the atom is composed is essential in order to arrive at a new position of equilibrium this adjustment of equilibrium amongst the balkan allies is a necessary preliminary to further stability the adjustment is by blood and carnage because that is still the tribunal to which the civilized world resorts the necessity for this particular outburst of blood and carnage might not at this moment have occurred had it not been for the intervention of the great powers who prevented bulgaria from completing her work and driving the turks out of reach of a renewal of mischief and who set up an autonomous albania and thereby gave servia a grievance which she could only hope to remedy at bulgaria's expense no one who has had a first-hand knowledge of the bulgarian character would believe that the bulgars were capable of faking an ideal or of dropping an ideal which they had once visualized and that they had visualized the ideal of freedom of emergence into the light of nationhood from the darkness of an asphyxiating tyranny was at the time i was in the balkans clearly shown by illustrations large and small End of chapter six chapters seven and eight of war and women by mrs st clair stobart this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven every theatre in sophia was closed because all the actors were at the front and the actresses were in the hospitals all the schools and colleges were closed because the professors were in the fighting line one professor at whose house i called with dr radeff had volunteered for service as telegraphist at the front but because he was too valuable in his own department in sophia the government had refused permission however when we called at his house and asked if he was at home the servant replied in a matter-of-fact way no professor has gone to the war he had apparently taken the law into his own hands had shouldered his rifle and was now in the forefront of the fight probably alas killed in that battle so disastrous to the professors and artists of sophia which took place near a village through which later i passed on the trek from jamboli i visited also that afternoon some of the smaller as well as the larger improvised hospitals in sophia and the story was everywhere the same splendid enthusiasm amongst nurses and doctors but in the latter case hopeless undermanning many of the best surgeons being at the front and in the case of the nurses a general lack of training and of experience i felt that if this were the case here in the capital any help that the corps would give would be doubly serviceable nearer to the fighting line where volunteers would be fewer in number when therefore in reply to dr radeff dr kiranoff telephoned that he gratefully accepted my offer of service i made up my mind that our work must be as near to the front as possible i was anxious that arrangements should be definite before i cabled to the corps and not satisfied with the vagueness of a telephone message and desirous of obtaining every form of official sanction in tangible shape i arranged to start immediately for stara zagora to receive from dr kiranoff himself definite information as to where and what our work would be and what equipment would be necessary i had the good fortune to have been accompanied from london by my friend j Blank, and by mr noel buxton m p and his brother harold who were on their way to join the military staff having all been presented with free passes and with red cross officially stamped brassards we started in a train reserved for military and red cross purposes at seven a m on our twelve hours journey as the train steamed out of the station inset between the snow illumined mountains of itosh on the south and the balkan range on the north was surprisingly beautiful the new cathedral with its golden cupolas reflecting the brilliance of the morning sun spoke aloud of the aspirations of the bulgars and of the marvels that had been accomplished during a short thirty-five years of autonomy by this wonderful people the journey all the way was full of tragic interest at every station stretchers and ambulance carts were in readiness to convey the victims to hospitals along the lines of communication and round each north-bound train anxious friends and relatives crowded eager to see if their beloved were amongst those maimed or dying 
who were hobbling with improvised crutches as best they could to the waiting carts sometimes a little group silent with bared heads would be carrying to the train on his last journey for burial in his native town the coffined body of an officer who had died of his wounds in hospital had passed across the blood-filled trenches to the land of freedom at every station contingents of red cross women attended night and day to give hot tea and bread and cheese to wounded and red cross travellers we also received and gratefully their hospitality for there was no other food procurable restaurant keepers like all other human males in bulgaria were busy pouring out not tea and coffee but human blood the lines were of course monopolized by the military and truckloads of murder spreading batteries of machine guns both bulgarian and serbian and of the soldiers uniformed in brown or in grey of both nationalities streamed southwards in one continuous flow the horrors of war were vividly portrayed for whilst the trucks going south were full of fine specimens of bulgarian manhood eager to get to the front to strike for the freedom of their brethren and shouting enthusiastically the national shumi maritza the trains going north were full of human wreckage returning from the front and on its way to the various evacuation hospitals along the line and as the heavily freighted trains slowly passed each other at the stations the salutations spogum spogum between those who maimed and crippled had already faced death and those who were now on their way to meet whatever the fate of war might bring must have moved the stoutest heart that was not already inured to the tragedies of warfare but that evening a pleasing diversion awaited us for when we arrived at stara zagora a straggling townlet lately rebuilt for the seventh time after having been burnt and devastated by the turks we were greeted by a deputation consisting of the mayor and prefect and interpreters who came into the corridor of our train to welcome mr buxton who for his services to the bulgarian peoples is very much persona grata in bulgaria i have heard criticisms of the balkan committee's efforts for the balkan people from those who look out on life from the prison loopholes of a narrow nationality isn't there say these armchair critics plenty of work to be done in their own country but the secret of usefulness is not to wait for this that or the other special work to come to hand but to treat as our work work needing to be done which comes our way and on this occasion i was particularly appreciative of mr buxton's work for the bulgarian people for after an address of welcome to him had been read and interpreted i came in for a share of reflected glory and was invited with the others to a dinner which was to be given in his honour we were first driven in carriages to the private houses where we were respectively to receive hospitality for the night and were then conducted to the restaurant in addition to the mayor and the prefect of the little town the director of the medical military department was i was glad to hear to be present with his staff and an opportunity would thus be offered me of talking with him under favourable circumstances and arranging as i hoped the sphere of operations for the work of the convoy corps all this sounded eminently satisfactory and i was much relieved at finding that dr kiranoff had not already moved on to a new base the evening promised to be full of interest the mayor could speak only bulgarian and his conversational efforts were interpreted by a bulgarian lady who knew neither french nor german but only english the officers present knew no english but only french or german the remarks of the mayor had therefore to be reinterpreted into either or both these languages for their benefit conversation was thus a little polyglottish but it was of course full of interest centring round the incidents and events the battles and triumphs of the latest phases of the war and in happy innocence of coming trouble i was in a detached way thoroughly enjoying myself the stage of the dinner was duly reached when liqueurs and cigarettes were handed round and toast time arrived the mayor rose and proposed england and included in his praise of the old country a warm eulogy of mr buxton the latter in due course responded in the french language all this i was enjoying still unconcerned when suddenly as mr buxton sat down amidst an outburst of applause he turned to me i was sitting next to him and said i say i think you'd better get up and say something a thousand times rather would i have had him ask me to put my head on the executioner's block but i answered quietly and quickly all right what language had i better speak in well i spoke in french perhaps you'd better speak in german he whispered cold-bloodedly very well i said 
as though an impromptu speech in the german language was the sort of thing i did every night before going to bed who shall i speak for oh i don't know he answered anybody anything you like only hurry up all right i murmured as the buzz of conversation around us stopped in a horrible hush of expectation i'll speak for the women of england so i did i don't remember fortunately what i said but to my surprise it was apparently satisfactory for when i had finished dr kiranoff his face beaming with smiles came up to me and shaking me warmly by both hands said in german look here a woman who can get up at a moment's notice and make an impromptu speech like that in the german language is capable of anything what work do you want to do where do you want to go my suit was won i replied meekly i want please to go as near the front as possible so you shall he answered i'm moving on to-morrow to kirk Kilisse, which is about to become the headquarters of the bulgarian army this will be within the active zone of operations and therefore in the more pressing need of nursing and surgical aid you shall if you like come too and improvise a hospital on your own can you do this as i had already ascertained that no foreigners would be allowed by the bulgarians in field hospital work and that there would therefore be no chance of obtaining consent to help in convoy work between field and base hospital i of course gladly accepted dr kiranoff's offer he asked me to come to his office next morning that he might send by telephone instructions to the commandant of kirk Kilisse. this i did waiting all the morning for the response which came satisfactorily at last it was agreed that on reaching kirk Kilisse with the corps i was to present myself at the headquarters of the commandant and receive final orders the parting words of the p m o as he saluted and wished me good-bye were auf wiedersehen at kirk Kilisse i at once cabled home to the corps for those members who had already been provisionally selected to start at once for sophia i told them as far as was possible by cable the nature of the work and that they must bring surgical instruments and appliances stretchers and such hospital equipment as they could muster mr noel buxton as chairman of the balkan war relief committee generously undertook to pay the journey expenses of the corps members to and from sophia from sophia onwards we should as a part henceforth of the bulgarian army be provided for by the bulgarian government and as i could further rely upon the bulgarian red cross store of supplies in sophia for supplementing deficiencies in our own equipment the road was clearing for action in promising fashion End of chapter seven chapter eight i knew however that a week at least must elapse before the corps could arrive at sophia i determined therefore to spend some of the interval by journeying on to jamboli there to make preliminary arrangements for the convoy of the corps thence to kirk Kilis. for the railway line via adrianople had been cut by the turks and the only way to reach our destination would be to travel in rough bullock wagons over the road up mountains and the rolling plains of thrace bullocks and wagons might now be difficult to procure and need to be ordered in advance also at jamboli i wished to take the opportunity of studying further the working of emergency hospitals for i had guessed and rightly that the state of affairs prevailing in the hospitals at sophia would be compared to the conditions in the remoter and smaller towns like the proverbial green tree to the dry and so it was the buildings were of course smaller and in most cases hopelessly inappropriate under ordinary circumstances for the reception of wounded multitudes in one instance a hospital had been improvised in a building that had been in normal times a large boys school as evidenced by the pile of desks and benches heaped in a conglomerate mass exposed to snow frost and rain in the yard outside the hospital contained at the moment when i arrived to visit it late one afternoon two hundred beds which were occupied by two hundred fifty patients lying three in two beds placed close together and was staffed by one surgeon and five nurses even working night and day it was impossible for the wounds to be dressed more than once in every twenty-four hours this condition of affairs was considering the severe nature of the wounds drastic enough but i was present when one evening at nine o'clock there arrived a further convoy of bullock wagons bringing three hundred additional wounded from lula burgas it was a pouring wet night the men had been jolted in open springless ox-wagons their wounds untended for five days 
and as they were carried in on stretchers and deposited on the floor of the large entrance hall or hobbled in on crutches which had been cut from trees by the roadside their condition was indescribable indescribable also were my feelings as these men a dozen at a time streamed into the little surgery to have their wounds dressed and i saw the herculean task of those five overworked but calm and heroic sisters and of the surgeon who was in the operating theatre realizing as i did that at home hundreds of skilled and disciplined nurses who had offered their services had been told that there was no work fitted for women in the balkans shirts and trousers were frequently glued with clotted blood to the wounds and had to be wrenched or cut away with three hundred patients outside urgently needing to be tended in addition to the two fifty already in the wards delicate handling was impossible collar gall with which in our own hospital we later at the request of the bulgarian doctors experimented with marvellous effect had not apparently yet been introduced the wound was simply smeared with iodine then wrapped in white sterilized lint cotton wool and bandage and the patient would hobble out to spend the night wherever in the town he could find a shelter only the stretcher bound and those for whom walking was impossible were retained and laid on mattresses on the floor wherever spare corners could be found i could not discover when if ever those devoted women and that surgeon slept but they were calm and philosophical as though the conditions were not at all abnormal nor were they indeed abnormal when at that time as i was told there were in jamboli eight doctors for seven hospitals and two thousand patients i spent a day in making friends with the commandant in whose hands would rest arrangements for our convoy to kirkkilis he was very friendly and as his guest jay and i lunched and dined with him and his wife at the little restaurant we watched the departure of the buxtons who left in a government automobile for kisiligatch where as recounted in mr buxton's interesting book with the bulgarian staff they joined the army staff the next day we entrained for sophia where i was to meet the corps and escort them back to jamboli and on to kirk Kilis. the eight hours journey took twenty-five hours from eleven a m to twelve noon the next day there were of course no sleeping berths but we had been given a carriage to ourselves however as the train was leaving some military officials asked us if we would as a favour make room for two wounded bulgarian officers who would otherwise have to wait for another twenty-four hours before starting for their homes in sophia one of these had been wounded in the leg and we of course insisted that he should lie with his leg outstretched sleep was therefore as usual out of the question for the rest of us this officer had been wounded and left upon the field of battle he heard turks approaching and crawled down the opposite slope of the hill and hid all that night under some bushes he was eventually found and conveyed by bulgarian soldiers to a wayside hospital but he had during his crawl along the earth contracted tetanus now in bulgaria tetanus is regarded as an infectious disease as soon therefore as it showed its usual symptoms he was removed from the ward in which he had lain and placed in a small dark room by himself here he was neglected and but for the help given by a devoted soldier servant a comrade who had fortunately only been wounded in the arm and could therefore move about and bring him food and look after him he would undoubtedly have died all this the officer told us was unknown to his young wife who had not even been told that he was wounded his return would be to her a surprise he was afraid he said to shock her by cabling to her now and he was wondering whether she would be at home when he arrived or perhaps be away visiting her parents in some inaccessible country place he and his comrade who had been wounded in the arm told us ghastly incidents of atrocities which they had seen committed by the turks upon the battlefield stories of atrocities must of course be accepted with reserve but it is not unreasonable to assume the possibility that cruelties will be committed by a people whose religion enjoins not only scorn and contempt but wholesale slaughter also even mutilation of the unbeliever it is proclaimed in the eighth chapter of the koran as a precept of holiness i will cast a dread into the hearts of the unbelievers therefore strike off their heads and strike off all the ends of their fingers this shall they suffer because they have resisted god and his apostle but after all our own ancestors were still worshipping odin in the eleventh century so we cannot brag over much our wounded officers had much of realistic interest to tell us of the various battles in which they had taken part 
in one charge which they graphically described they told us how the bulgarian cavalry had cut down the turks as though they were slicing cucumbers they also told us and this was later confirmed by all the patients in our own hospital that the turk dreaded the bayonet more than anything else and everywhere the same quaint story was told in explanation of this dread it was apparently due to a misinterpretation of words for the bulgarian words of command for the bayonet charge are napred na nosh but the turks with an indifferent knowledge of the bulgarian language understood the command to be po pet na nosh this means five on one bayonet and the turk objecting to overcrowding on the bayonet rather wisely adopted the alternative of flight the time passed quickly while we listened to the arabian night stories of the adventures of our friends the night was also diversified by frequent stoppages for the disembarkation at stations of the wounded once in the middle of the night as our train steamed slowly out of a station into the darkness we passed a train going south heavily laden with batteries of servian guns and crowded with servian soldiers on their way to help in the attack on adrianople suddenly a great shout of spagom spagom the bulgarian and servian salutation vibrated along the length of both long trains and looking out we saw in the other train the open doors the roofs of the trucks and the windows of the carriages all crowded with sturdy sunburnt servian peasant soldiers while at our own train windows and open truck doors appeared simultaneously the ghost-like forms of men white-faced mutilated with blood-stained tattered garments both trainloads of whole and of wounded jostling each other for front places all alike eager to catch a sight of comrades in a common cause and cheer for deeds done and to be done our own two wounded officers had jumped up at the magic sound of spogum and before they could be prevented the lame one had hobbled to the window of the outside corridor and was waving both arms and shouting as loudly as his weakness would allow whilst the other not satisfied with waving his one remaining arm had seized his comrade's crutch and was enthusiastically waving it out of the window shouting with all the strength that he could muster to swell that never-to-be-forgotten sound of spogum spogum but the journey long enough eventually for all of us came to an end at twelve next day before we parted from our officer friends who persisted in thinking we had helped to make them comfortable they made me accept as a token of their gratitude a mother-of-pearl electric lamp which one of them had carried in his pocket throughout the war at sophia station they were helped out of the train by sanitaires and were borne off by friends and were soon indistinguishable amongst the usual seething mass of soldiers stretchers and stern-faced women who crowded every platform End of chapter eight chapters nine and ten of war and woman by mrs st clair stobart this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine my work during the next few days whilst i awaited the arrival of the corps was well defined i must buy or loan everything in the way of hospital equipment on which i could lay my hands mr buxton had on behalf of his committee put a sum at my disposal and the croix rouge would i knew give all the assistance in their power meanwhile queen eleonora had now returned to the palace from philippopolis and her tour of hospitals along the line and she very graciously sent me a message through m delmar director of the king's botanical gardens and major-domo at the palace who had been very kind and helpful to me in many ways that she wished me to come and talk to her about the corps and our proposed work at kirk -Kilis. accompanied by m delmar and dr radeff i therefore went to the palace and was received by the queen in her own private room she spoke english perfectly and appeared much interested in all i told her and patted my hand approvingly as we talked she would like she told me to make the acquaintance of the corps and hoped i would arrange for them to spend a night at sophia on their way to jamboli that she might see them and that they might have a rest after their long journey then turning to m delmar she told him he was to let me have a large consignment of blankets shirts sheets and bed garments which had just arrived for her from england and she also requested dr radeff to help me in every way he could i left the palace feeling that the bulgarian nation were very fortunate in possessing this particularly capable and practical princess as their queen there was no red tape or affectation of any sort about her 
she was full of insight intuition and human sympathy i had the privilege of seeing her and talking with her at the palace twice again and each time i confirmed my first impression that her charm to me at any rate consisted in the fact that she was not a royal automaton but a real live woman and now my way was clear for dr radeff generously put the store-rooms of the croix rouge at my disposal with permission to take any equipment i desired i accordingly selected blankets bed-linen crockery pots pans knives forks spoons etc to my heart's content i now had taken in conjunction with equipment which the corps would bring everything i was likely to be able to get except beds and beds of a portable nature were i was informed unprocurable having all been requisitioned for the existing hospitals in sophia and elsewhere but beds i must have so i took no notice of the pessimists and began a systematic hunt in unlikely places the likely places having presumably all been emptied of contents for two whole days i was unsuccessful but finally on a deserted wharf i came upon some suspicious-looking packing-cases from one of which was projecting something uncommonly like the leg of an iron bedstead i therefore fetched some workmen whom i saw in the distance with some tools told them to unfasten the wooden case and lo and behold the usual miracle which always comes when faith and will are backing an ideal the packing-case and many other packing-cases contained between them seventy-five light portable iron bedsteads which any of the hospitals in sophia would have given their eyes to possess iron bedsteads which henceforth were mine for no sooner had the first case disclosed its treasures than the owner by the help i suppose of my magic wishing carpet suddenly appeared and i commandeered against payment the whole lot exactly the very beds i wanted and now all i had to do was to arrange for mattresses and pillow-cases of sacking which would all eventually be filled with straw to be prepared also i must procure some interpreters not only to translate the wishes of our future patients but to help us on the journey i was particularly fortunate in securing the services of four young men two of whom were english and spoke bulgarian whilst two were bulgarian and spoke english and also two bulgarian girl teachers who spoke excellent english all was now in readiness for the arrival of the corps i knew nothing of the size of the hospital nor the number of patients we should be given to treat but as i had procured all that was procurable in the way of hospital necessaries and i knew that the corps would also bring all they had been able to collect under miss streetfield's able superintendence things would probably work out all right in the recipe of that delicate dainty success the heavier ingredients of organization and will-power must be lightly whipped with faith due taste in this case at all events things worked out in the most marvellous fashion for on receipt of my cable my second-in-command and officers of the corps in london contrived within a week to collect from friends six hundred pounds with this money they purchased surgical instruments and appliances blankets stores and other equipment a perfect supplement to that which i had been able to requisition in sophia and now at last the corps were due to arrive and with all arrangements completed i had the satisfaction of welcoming to bulgaria the first company of women who have as a self-contained unit set up and administered a hospital of war within the zone of active operations End of chapter nine chapter ten the unit numbered sixteen and included besides myself as commandant and directrice two sisters miss v adams and miss p gadsden four other fully qualified trained nurses six members for general duty as cooks dressers nurses etc and the three women doctors dr alice hutchison dr d tudor and dr e ramsbotham of the splendid services which these three doctors rendered to the wounded and of the spirit in which they took all the rough and tumble of the expedition i cannot speak too highly the contingent arrived without mishap at sophia they had expected from my earlier instructions before i knew of the royal command that they would be travelling straight through to jambouli but hand baggage was quickly collected the heavier luggage and equipment left in the van to be found again at jambouli and the whole party was conveyed to the hotel continental here our friend dr radeff had kindly arranged for their reception for the night the effects of the four days and nights continuous journey without sleeping berths 
were soon obliterated by a wash and a good breakfast and the morning was spent in seeing the town though the public buildings were of course in consequence of the war all closed in the afternoon m delmas most kindly himself conducted the little party over the royal botanical gardens and the greenhouses of the palace then at seven p m we all met at the hotel bulgaria which is just opposite the palace and were here joined by dr radeff who accompanied us on our visit to the queen at the palace we were met by m delmas and were shown into an ante-room which formed one of the long suite of fine big rooms with parquet floors and walls hung with oil portraits of king ferdinand and his ancestors of his first queen marie louise of bourbon and of their four children prince boris prince cyril and the princesses eudoxy and nadezda also of course portraits of queen eleonora we waited a few minutes and were then ushered into a larger room beyond here the members formed up in line in readiness for inspection by the queen who dressed in a nurse's uniform soon appeared she first received me and made many kind inquiries as to how the members had fared on the journey from london and as to the arrangements made for our farther journey next day to jamboli next i introduced her to our officers and then her majesty spoke to the members as they stood in line and asked each in turn to describe to her the special work for which she was prepared she showed great interest when mrs godfrey as cook-in-chief explained that the corps cooks were trained not only to work in well-equipped kitchens but that they learned in camp to dig their own camp-fire trenches and to build of mud and turf their own chimneys and fireplaces and were thus independent of conditions this very much pleased queen eleonora and turning to one of her ladies-in-waiting she said ah what an excellent thing it would be if our bulgarian ladies went through this training and then her majesty gave attention to our uniform on which she bestowed much praise it struck her she said as being eminently practical and workmanlike it consists of norfolk jacket with large concertina pockets full skirt which divides back and front when required for riding either side saddle or astride and pith helmet hat all made in a greeny grey tweed material shirts are of white silk for officers and of white cotton for the rank and file in ordinary times whilst in camp and on active service as at the moment all wear flannel shirts of a colour to match the uniform the principle upon which the uniform had been selected was serviceability in the field and it has admirably answered its purpose though there is too much skirt for work in the hospital and for cooking washable linen frocks and white caps and aprons are worn the question of uniform has never been to me unimportant for i believe that clothes despicable as we think them are as to felsdrock remarks so unspeakably significant it is as a rule precisely those who devote the most time and money to clothes and who wear clothes that are in every sense extravagant who have least appreciation of their value as symbols women who shrink from wearing in the street anything which betokens a uniform are not as a rule afraid to wear garments which if they represent anything at all are representative of ideas that are unnameable the shrinking from wearing clothes which are distinctive of an idea means a shrinking from acknowledgment of that idea the desire of the part of women to wear something that will not be discovered as a uniform means a half-hearted belief or none in the idea behind the uniform or it betokens lack of faith in the capacity of the public to recognize an idea is there an idea a distinctive idea at the back of your work whatever it may be then that idea must be represented by clothes if the idea has truth and honesty and soundness in it the clothes will savour of truth and honesty and soundness they will not be outrageous unless the idea at the back of them is outrageous if then there is a sound idea at the back of the work which women are to do in warfare it must be symbolized for the public as the boy scout movement has been symbolized by a distinctive uniform a uniform which without being in any sense extravagant is readily recognized and speaks for itself as representative of work not of dolldom or half-heartedness women will never as a sex do useful work till they wear clothes which are appropriate to work and though this may come as a revelation to many there is no physiological reason against this the essence of all science says carlyle lies in the philosophy of clothes queen eleonora had the wisdom to observe that our uniform though possibly not becoming to good looks 
was very becoming to good work and she thoroughly approved her majesty then after she had walked down the line and talked with each in turn including of course the doctors in whom she showed great interest told me to disband the members and let them disperse about the room the two young princesses stepdaughters of the queen were also present they were about fifteen and sixteen years of age and looked very charming in white princess frocks made quite plainly except for some beautiful bulgarian embroidery on the yoke they were also to the manner born and moved around amongst us all and talked to everybody in english understanding excellently how to make even the shyest feel at ease they themselves were too modest to tell us but the queen mentioned that they also were taking a share in the work of alleviating the overwhelming burden of national suffering and every morning with their own hands these little princesses baked bread for the wounded soldiers and took it themselves each day to the hospitals finally the queen before she left expressed again to me her gratitude for our good will and proposed services to her soldiers then she and the princesses gave to each of us signed photographs of themselves also packets of chocolate for the journey after which bidding us godspeed her majesty left us after a little further conversation with the princesses the ladies-in-waiting m delmar dr radeff and the officers in attendance we departed feeling that a motive of loyalty and personal affection for bulgaria's queen would now be added to our motive of loyalty to our own cause and give additional zeal and enthusiasm to our work of nursing the soldiers of the bulgarian nation the next morning when we arrived at six o'clock at sophia station we found awaiting us a courier from the palace he had been sent by the queen with a kind message of farewell and also with a large case of provisions for the long train journey to jamboli there was no time then to write a letter of thanks but we arrived at philippopolis that afternoon the train stopped for half an hour and we were met by the british consul-general and his wife mr and mrs wilkie young who came to the station to greet us and most kindly offered any assistance in their power i was then by their kind help enabled to dispatch my telegram to the queen without the usual delay and bother of long hours of waiting at the censor's office the half-hour went all too quickly whilst we talked over glasses of tea served in russian fashion with slices of lemon and no milk in the crowded station-room with mr and mrs young about their good work of organization of relief for the families of the soldiers and of the general prospects of the war etc we were sorry not to see more of philippopolis a beautiful little town named after philip of macedon and ideally placed amongst five rocky hills but after this point the interest of our journey was intensified for we were now drawing near to jamboli and instead of taking the usual southerly route via adrianople to kirkkilis it was necessary as the turks had cut this line of rails to travel eastwards via starazagora to jamboli and thence traverse the rhodope mountains and the tracian plains a seven days trek in the ubiquitous bullock wagon as our train drew up at the little ramshackle town of jamboli at midnight in pouring rain and pitch-black darkness i guessed we should thenceforth have need of all the resourcefulness at our command to my relief i found that by order of dr radeff the croix rouge had kindly arranged for officials to meet us with automobiles and convey us and our hand baggage to night quarters at the roman catholic convent hospital about two miles from the station here we were hospitably received by the sisters of mercy we slept in wards lately occupied by wounded soldiers and early next morning in the chapel ante-room we breakfasted on tea without milk the hard brown bread of the country and white sheep's milk cheese and now the task before us was to procure ox-carts forty it was reckoned would be needed for ourselves and the equipment eighty oxen or buffaloes and forty drivers and make a start that evening if possible but it was still raining in torrents we were two miles from the station from which the start must be made owing to the heavy luggage the cars of last night had vanished been requisitioned elsewhere no conveyance of any sort was available and the mud was in places knee-deep everybody who had ever at any time known anything about anything had gone to the war and if by chance with one's bulgarian interpreter safely pinned to one side one ever did find the right person who was likely to be able to give information as to carts and oxen etc that right person invariably turned out to be a greek or a turk who couldn't understand bulgarian and one had to begin all over again 
it is true that my friend the commandant had on my previous visit said i was to let him know when i returned and that he would help me to get all i wanted but when after considerable difficulties i succeeded in running to earth the commandant behold it was a different commandant who knew not joseph and had never heard of the convoy corps he was very kind and sympathetic and the contrast between this stolid bulgarian and my impetuous english character might have been interesting to psychologists but i was not out for psychological study and it was distinctly troublesome to find that nothing whatever had yet been done towards procuring the large number of bullock wagons we required for to me every hour's delay in getting on the move was of fatal importance on the one hand we were still separated by seven days from the place where lay our work and if the war were to end before we arrived our journeyings and labours might be i feared in vain on the other hand the bulgarians had swept the turkish forces victoriously before them along the route we were to follow up to the present but if the tide of battle should unexpectedly turn in favour of the turks and the turkish army were to roll back and retake the thracian battlefields over which we had to pass ellipsis i was fully conscious in the secret recesses of my own mind of this latter risk and indeed the turks have since returned step by step across our trek but unless one acts in commonplace moments upon the inspiration of one's more valiant moments nothing of value is ever achieved and nothing that is worth doing is ever accomplished without some risk i was on mohammedan territory and i felt as mohammed once had felt that if the sun now stood on my right hand and the moon on my left ordering me to desist i could not obey the risks only stimulated resourcefulness and determination to push on with all speed and before the day was over all obstacles had been overcome eighty oxen and buffaloes were being yoked to forty carts by forty bulgarian and turkish drivers and all that now remained to be done was to procure provisions for the trek we had been told that this would be a simple matter that there was no need to bring food from sophia that jamboli would be able to provide us with all the food we should require en route to kirkulis an interesting bit of mythology quite unfounded on fact we found that every atom of food there may have ever been in this straggling village had already been consumed by the thousands of transport drivers who had from the beginning of the war traversed this same route to and from the front the kind commandant and his kind wife both did their utmost and accompanied us in our raid upon the shops but when we got there the cupboard was bare and so the poor corps had none the only result was two half loaves of sour brown bread two small tins of sardines and a couple of hundred precious eggs the usual reassuring labels eggs new laid eggs equal to new laid eggs were all lacking and we had to take on trust eggs that for aught we knew might not have been laid within the memory of man within the memory of woman those eggs are likely not to be forgotten for many a long day they will thus enjoy immortality at both ends of their existence we had however no choice but to rely on optimistic assurances that we should be able to supplement our larder at kisiligatch and at other villages through which we should pass more mythology for it was a case all the time of if you are passing you can pass but a la guerre comme à la guerre nothing was of consequence compared to the fact that our tumbrils were at last all loaded twenty-eight with luggage and equipment and all we had to do now was to stow ourselves away two in each of the twelve remaining carts fastened the bulgarian flag red green and white to the leading cart for we were now a part of the bulgarian army and get away End of chapter ten chapter eleven of war and woman by mrs st clair stobart this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven it was four o'clock in the afternoon and the rain was still falling steadily when the little cortege began its seven days trek across the roadless plains and mountains of rumelia and thrace we had been provided with an escort of two soldiers and two policemen who walked beside us with fixed bayonets the carts small and narrow were springless and without covering except for an inefficient straw mat slung to little purpose across the top the draughts therefore when at night it froze or rained or blew a hurricane were of an interesting variety the sides of the carts sloped to a spinal ridge in the middle 
in theory this was covered with hay or straw commandeered en route whenever it was procurable but in practice the oxen invariably ate the bedding by day with the connivance of the drivers who could not otherwise get enough fodder for their starving cattle sleep therefore for two even lying sardine fashion heads and feet alternately was a little difficult each cart was drawn by either two white oxen or two buffaloes and was driven or led by peasants of whom about two-thirds were bulgarian and one-third were bulgarian turks my driver pietro was a splendid fellow typically bulgarian dignified silent always courteous and obliging he owned about forty acres of land and because he was a taxpayer was not bound to serve in the army he was however taking his share of national service by working for the army transport some of the drivers walked obligingly alongside in the mud which was sometimes up to the axles of the carts others insisted stolidly and somewhat sulkily in sitting according to their usual custom on the front of the cart indifferent to such trifles as to whether or no this necessitated their squatting on the feet of their inside passengers when the latter were trying to sleep it was the duty of the escort to direct the route and to keep in order the scratch crew of drivers who being composed of turks and of bulgarians were liable to give trouble but each nationality kept to its own campfire at night and cooked its own food separately and on the whole all behaved excellently once one of the drivers had a narrow escape from being bayoneted for insubordination the oxen had been of course all through the war wretchedly overworked and underfed and one evening when our guides desired after a long day's trek to push on for another span this driver refused to take his weary oxen any farther he however hurriedly changed his mind when he saw the gleaming bayonet of one of the soldiers making straight for the middle of his heart he gave no further trouble this escort soldier told me he was going to the front as soon as he had done his work with us he was longing he said to have a thrust at the turks because in eighteen seventy seven during the russo-turkish war they had murdered his father and mother before his eyes and left himself for dead the first night's outspan was not idyllic we had started late rather than be delayed for another day and owing to the abnormal condition of the track which could not at that point be manoeuvred in the dark we were obliged to halt for the night on ground which had been trampled into a quagmire feet deep in mud and ordure by the many thousand oxen which had preceded us across thrace to the main seat of the war the night was coal dark and rain was still falling when we outspanned and set to work to try and light a fire to boil a kettle and cook some eggs before settling to sleep in our ox-cart beds the conditions were in every way so thoroughly disgusting leaving no loophole of alleviation that i was thankful for the mud in which we had to puddle about was so deep and the state of our skirts and boots and putties became in a few minutes whilst we searched for wet wood so abjectly ludicrous that the situation could only be treated as a huge joke and from that point of view we all agreed that we hoped never to encounter for the remainder of our lives anything more humorous the impossibility of lighting a fire by which to cook food made the absence of food to cook a godsend and the joy of moving off at five next morning from our mud and manure midden more than compensated for past inconveniences joys are relative and this little experience greatly accelerated our pleasure when after a three hours trek we outspanned on some grass by the roadside where in comparative luxury we could boil a kettle and experiment on those prime evil eggs our route lay via kiselagach dervent siliolo and Genergi, through about fifteen small villages of these villages some would be inhabited by bulgarians even in territory which had before the war been turkish others by turks it was with some keenness that on our arrival at kisiligach the first possible source of food supply we set out marketing but food in quantities was unprocurable here as elsewhere and we considered ourselves in luck's way when at the end of a tour of the tiny hamlet we found a room which in ordinary times would have been a butcher's shop and which was now the last resting place of one small undefinable lump of pork this we seized unceremoniously together with a small iron grill which was lying by chance upon the counter i wanted the grill and the owner generously presented it to me as a present we only found otherwise a few loaves of hard brown bread and some sheep's milk cheese but sufficient unto the day must be the food thereof many more people die from overfeeding than from lack of food 
we quickly adjusted our standard of requirements to circumstances and were therefore quite content as this was the largest village we should pass through on our route a supper of even this unalluring lump of hog's flesh would probably in future loom in imagination as a legendary luxury except for this piece of pork there was nothing remarkable about kisiligatch unless it were the women they dressed in garments beautifully embroidered by themselves and all of them even to the tiniest girls carried little spinning machines which they worked as they walked along as though they were unconscious that a war was raging all around them and that hosts of armies had passed through their village and eaten them out of house and home i understood later by comparison with other villages through which we passed their apparent unconcern for with the exception of the raid upon their food supplies this village had been left unimpaired beyond the frontier it was unusual to find a village which had not been either burned or devastated by the turks or been deserted for fear of the turks the whole of that portion of thrace was a depopulated wilderness time after time when with renewed hopes we approached something which had from the distance looked like a possible living village we would find deserted ruins and derelict homes the only sign of life would be a starving troop of skeleton dogs and cats with still enough life left to crawl out and petition us for food only here and there had a village been spared and on arriving at one of these rare oases it was the duty of our soldiers and policemen to secure for us as much bread and cheese as they could commandeer the houses when there were any left were picturesquely made of sun-dried mud with terra-cotta tilings and with steps or verandas dutch fashion to serve as shelter from the sun and rain on one rare and fortunate occasion we had been able to make our midday halt at one of the small villages which was still more or less intact a bulgarian peasant woman opened the door of her hut and came outside to look at us as it was raining i asked her if she would allow us to eat our bread and cheese under the friendly shelter of her step she agreed and then went back into the house to go on with her work and close the door we in the meantime laid out our spartan meal upon the step and lighted a fire in an adjoining shed to boil water for our precious tea another woman with a baby in her arms and three small children clutching at her skirts had been standing on the step watching us in silence i asked her if she lived here and she told us that she did not belong to these parts that she came from a village near adrianople and was now with her children being hospitably sheltered in this two-roomed cottage by our hostess who was her cousin her husband and her father had been captured by the turks to be transport drivers of oxen and were now besieged in adrianople she did not expect to hear their fate till the war was over i wanted the woman inside to come out and join us in our talk and i opened the door and standing on the step called to her she was making bread and two small children hid shyly behind her skirts when they saw me while two more were lying asleep turkish fashion on a mat upon the floor the woman had mixed the dough in a long trough and was now putting the bread which she had fashioned into long loaves into the oven built in the dutch fashion of bricks and heated with wood the usual fuel the bread looked excellent a thousand times better than the stuff made by soldiers with which we had often to be content and i praised it the woman shook her head we've no salt she said that has all been taken by the soldiers but all the same it looks lovely i answered and thinking of my starving corps i should be glad if you would sell me some i'd rather be killed she answered curtly than let you have this bread it's all i've got my children would die their father's fighting she turned round sharply look at them can't you see they're starving one died last week and those she glanced towards the children on the step then stopped she had caught sight of our soldiers outside and knew they could commandeer the bread other soldiers had taken all she had last week and had given her nothing for it you can't have it she ended abruptly and shut the door upon me and for the first time i realized a grim reality that was subsequently often enough impressed upon me that one of the cruelest results of the wars men wage upon each other is the sufferings of the women and children men take all these sufferings for granted and in dispatches no mention is made of the heroism shown and the tortures endured by women by mothers for their starving children it is an evil thing that men only should witness the results of war 
wars will never cease till women at whatever cost to themselves are admitted behind the drop curtain and discover amongst the cardboard scenery and the grease paints which glorify for the public the tragedy of war the brutal realities which are the secrets of those behind the footlights and now these villages have all been revisited by the turks and what will have become of those two brave women and their children we of course left them their bread and trekked on over country that taken as a whole reminded one alternately of the rocky hills of dartmoor of the rolling veldt of the transvaal or of the plains of salisbury but a black silence brooded over the whole country which seemed mutely sullenly to be protesting against the stupendous folly and neglect of man for though nature had created a fine country with agricultural opportunities offering happiness to all man had made of it a black sahara there were no roads only tracks over old ploughed and pasture fields and neglected vineyards from which some of the famous bordeaux wines are grown occasionally we passed through woods of oak and beech scrub stunted as everything under turkish rule is always stunted everywhere for years trees had been cut down ruthlessly for fuel and nowhere was there visible any sign of replenishing the fast vanishing stock of timber it was impossible to read or write in the carts owing to the jolting in and out of the ruts worn deep in mud trampled by the thousands of bullock wagons which had preceded us conveying soldiers and military stores to kirk kilis and the front sometimes we would amuse ourselves by walking beside our carts for a few miles where the mud had dried a little and it became imperative to stretch cramped limbs though great care had to be taken that there were no stragglers left behind water was not very plentiful and the outspans were apparently not determined as in africa by the supply of springs or lakes and sometimes the halt would be made in a place where no water at all was procurable for boiling our kettle of tea the one luxury that was left to us we grew wary therefore after a bit and kept over treasured in bottles a supply of water from each place where there had been no scarcity for an emergency kettle this indifference as to the water supply on the part of the drivers was probably due to the fact that they themselves had no fads either about the necessity of clean drinking water or the necessity of drinking at all and if they ever were thirsty they would stoop down and drink contentedly from the mud puddles in the road over which myriads of oxen had passed if godliness and cleanliness are inseparable we were indeed a most unholy company for washing except an occasional lick and a promise of hands and face was out of the question for we passed no rivers only one spruit and the only available bathing water was from village pumps or wells we began to understand what a slum child feels when at the beginning of the winter it has its clothes sewn on ours never left our backs for eight days our average pace was one and a half to two kilometres an hour exasperatingly slow in view of our anxiety to get to work sometimes however the monotony of the day would be relieved by passing over a battlefield from which we could collect relics and from the disposition of the trenches reconstruct in imagination the main incidents of the fight at one place upon a plain which extended as far as the eye could reach the turks had evidently whilst encamped been taken by surprise they had obviously decamped in a great hurry for the field was strewn with remains of turkish tents and their peculiarly shaped tent pegs with shirts trousers papers torn pages from the koran cartridge cases bullets turkish music belonging to the band something of all sorts indicative of an encamped army scattered broadcast over a mile or so of plain one could almost hear that famous bulgarian war-cry pet nonosh and see the turks scampering scarified over the plain towards kirk kilis in front of us our routine each day was much the same as soon as day dawned the soldiers would arouse the drivers who had spent the night lying round their respective bulgarian and turkish campfires then the oxen which had been tied all night to the carts in which we were supposed to be asleep would be inspanned and a trek of two or three hours according to the nature of the country would be made before a halt was called for breakfast our cooks would then collect firewood and light a couple of fires boil the water for tea and proceed to cook the breakfast a valuable euphemism which was diligently upheld after a couple of hours of outspan we would jolt on again for another three or four hours then halt again and so on till nightfall when we would cook supper and go to bed thankful that another day was past and we were by so much nearer to our work 
going to bed was always an event of interest owing to the uncertainty as to whether there would be any bed in the shape of straw to lie on or whether whilst we were at supper the drivers would have taken it for their oxen on the first night of the trek i was going the round of the carts to see that all was well when as i came up behind the cart of one of the senior and most circumspect of the party i heard an exclamation of a surprisingly unparliamentary nature i knew something serious must have occurred for such an outbreak from such a quarter and with some anxiety as i came round the corner i inquired what was the matter i'm sure it's enough to make a saint swear came the answer the oxen have eaten all my bed i laughed and then the bedless one laughed and never once during the whole trek or indeed from the start to the finish of the expedition did i hear a word of grumbling or of discontent at any of the privations or inconveniences which were encountered by any of the party not even when on one occasion having by a miracle secured just before we turned in too late for that night's supper two precious chickens it was found in the morning that one had been eaten during the night by a starving cat this was at a turkish village then in possession of bulgarian soldiers most of the inhabitants had fled and the bulgarian soldiers were guarding turkish prisoners of war who were being made to work and were not apparently enjoying the new experience in this village we were rationed with bread made by soldiers unaccustomed to the task for themselves and for their prisoners and though eventually the bread had to be eaten to keep the wolf from the door we had every reason for believing that the local stores of bullets and of loaves had inadvertently got mixed and that we had been served from the wrong locker we quite understood why the krajaligan of old demanded tooth money or dyshack for the wear and tear of their teeth on the hard bread of the peasants a sense of humour was dished up as hors d'oeuvre at every meal and filled many a gastronomical blank End of chapter eleven